All right, we're live. The Apollo Road Podcast. I'm here with Navu and Chris Wheeler. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. So for context, um, it is July 15th, uh, 2020, the year of many things. Uh, But right now in the art world, it's COVID-19 really upending the whole way of doing business as an artist. So what do you guys, uh, what do you guys think about what's going on right now? Well, we're just uh, all hanging on and figuring things out along the way, um, trying to, you know, enjoy our life because it's time that we've never had before and spending time with our daughter, you know, everything in the past decade has happened so fast. And so we're just trying to appreciate, you know, the time that we have at home. Um, We travel a lot, probably half the weekends in a year, typically. And so um, to be able to slow down and see spring in Colorado, it's been a really special thing. Mm. That is a good point. Um, You know, my dad was, he was on the road for 20 plus years and uh, he definitely echoed the same thing of like, you know, two weeks at home, two weeks on the road, home, road, home, road. And I've heard from a couple of different people and sources on other shows and online that, uh, like this has been the longest stretch they've spent with their spouses ever since getting married. (laughs) Like I've heard a few people say that and that was kind of weird to me. I'm, you know, I'm not married or anything, but, uh, have you guys been, cause you guys are the rare case of artists that are a couple, but you're also doing the same in the same exact line of work, uh, doing shows. And so your, your perspective might be different, but so my dad, he was the artist, my mom, you know, she would travel to some shows when she had the time off, but it was usually a separate kind of thing. So being on the road together is different. Yeah. 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 I think we've spent a lot of time together before this as well. Like we were actually in the restaurant business together. And I think that pretty much destroys like nine out of 10 couples, they say. (laughs) And we also lived overseas together for about five years. That's another thing. I think that was just destroyed almost every couple we we knew over there. Yeah. That's a relationship killer. And now we're (laughs) artists together. So Mm -hmm. I think we've, You know, we've done all the tests for our relationship at this point. We've suffered through all the stress and all the... The Vegas odds are definitely in your favor then, if you've gone through all those. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We have to have some kind of a strong bond for sure. And Mm -hmm. we like to work with each other, you know. Cool. When we argue and stuff, but we we work well together. (laughs) We do. Yeah, we do enjoy each other's company. So that's actually a good transition. Why don't we do backgrounds and how you guys started? Um, You know, you can start whoever wants to take, take the first whack at it. Do you want to go first? You go. Sure. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I guess we'll talk about our background for art. Is that yeah. what you're t- So, yeah. First, I guess we'll say uh, medium and then when you first started. Okay. Well, um, in 1999, we actually both decided to move to Tainan, Taiwan. And um, Chris introduced me to... Uh, my, my first painting teacher and she taught me in the traditional art form of ink and brush and um, I studied quite intensively with her for about five years and then also had the opportunity to study under another teacher who taught me more of a contemporary style of ink and brush that people don't typically see here in the United States and so I was studying art and we um, realized that eventually when we would come back to the States, somebody would need to be able to mount my paintings. And so at that time, Chris volunteered and apprenticed under uh, Master Huang um, in Taiwan. And he taught Chris how to do the traditional art of stretching and mounting antique shoji screens and scrolls. And so he mounted my paintings, which was at that time the only way that my pieces can be stretched and displayed. And that's how he actually um, learned his art form is because the foundation of how these antique shoji screens and scrolls are stretched is how Chris actually stretches his paper to do his collage work. Wow. Okay. So really specialized technique, right? Like, and you guys said that you learned in Taiwan, so you learned from people that have been doing it for a long time. Yes. Um, so Tainan, Taiwan, the city that we lived in, was the haven for um, artists that fled China um, when um, Mao took over. Mm-hmm. And so the Nationalist Party, which is the opposition party, um, fled to Taiwan and took 
some of the uh, most prestigious artists to Taiwan and also a huge art collection. So there's a, an amazing art wow. collection in the Imperial uh, Museum um, in mm. Taipei that houses some really precious um, artifacts that they were able to save um, from China. And so a lot of the teachers um, ended up in Tainan. And Tainan is known as the cultural center of Taiwan. Mm. And so we had access to some of the world's best teachers when it came to calligraphy, ink and brush, um, the, the craft of mounting scrolls, um, sculptors. So we got immersed in the art community there and it was just um, extremely vibrant and just such a, a treat for us to be able to be a part of that community. And so um, we did that for five years. We did art shows there. You know, we art was such a big part of our life when we were living there. Wow. What are the, what were the art shows like there? Cause my only concept of art shows is in the States on the sidewalk, on the asphalt, white tent. Is it a same similar setup or is it much more um, integrated in the culture? They, the art shows that we participated in were more in, um, I guess they were community buildings. Yeah, they were indoor. They were indoors. Okay. We didn't see any outdoor art shows I don't think they there. Did that, yeah. I mean, that would be a night market or something. Yeah, mm. so it would be like a a night night market or a flea and craft market, mm. and those were more general market, just like large, a lot of people. Yeah, 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 sure. yeah and then okay. like a couple Buy of artists would be like thrown in there. <laughs> right. Um, but it wasn't a dedicated like art market. Okay, gotcha. Um, so. Chris, and you guys were there. So you studied, um, did you kind of like plot all of this out um, and how to join forces and, you know, use both of your skills in producing work? Or was it just sort of serendipitous how it kind of worked out? I think it was more serendipitous, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I did definitely wasn't thinking ahead yeah. that much. I just <laughs> wanted to scroll her work at that time. And okay. I knew when we got back, there'd be no one who could do that. And so describe that actually, uh, scrolling work, because I'm not super familiar with that process, but explain um, why it's like so rare. It's a way of layering paper on top of paper. And at certain points in the process, the paper is soaking wet. So you can completely wipe hmm. out the ink and watercolor hmm. with the ink painting very quickly. So it's a whole process and a way of doing it. They've been doing it for thousands of years in China. This is sure. not new. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. So, so I took that and... Um, brought it back and started doing my own collage okay. you know, with it. And we actually um, did antique restoration for a couple of yeah, uh, galleries things. when we were living in Seattle. So when we came back from Taiwan, um, we moved back to Seattle, which is okay. kind of where we met and where my family is from. Mm -hmm. And so um, we were sought out because it's not very often that you find somebody who can restore um, mm. antique shoji screens and scrolls, but also mm. have a painter in the house who can also touch up the artwork. Mm. So that was kind of, in a way, how we started our art business is doing antique restoration. Mm. And then um, John Fairman, the guy who really took us under his wing and gave us a lot of work to do, he started giving us these blank screens and I started painting on them and he sold them out of his gallery for us. Wow. And, um, and that was a really, I think, pivotal moment in time where we could see it kind of forming as a business, mm -hmm. you know, kind of doing a little bit of restoration, but also uh, coming up with a style of, you know, painting that I think is signature to mine. And so that was a really important point in developing kind of where I wanted to go with mm -hmm. ink and brush. Yeah, that uh, I think that's a very good point that it's rarely, rarely a pure play as an artist. I mean, you could be, you know, uh, you could be a trust and doing the show circuit for fun, right? Because you have you're not really worried about selling the work. But if you have to make a living from it, um, it's rarely just you know I'm just going to paint or I'm just going to sculpt. It's I have something on the side, right? And so it sounds like maybe the restoration work kind of helped you guys just pay the bills while you could just you know, be a little freer in your artwork and freer and like not having to like this painting is going to pay for rent. And you right. know, I think that's uh it's a yeah. good thing to have. Yeah. It's been yeah. interesting because both of our parents are not art parents. We didn't come from art families, mm -hmm. but I think both of us have always been very artistically inclined ever since we were young. It was just something that we were drawn to. I'm drawn to the visual arts, and then Chris is more drawn to, you know, literature. Um, and so um, when 
we came back, um, it was just kind of, we were just kind of figuring out as we went along. And um, I think that not going to art school was in a way beneficial to us because we didn't have all these other artists' ideas and, you know, images floating around our heads. And so the artwork that we create, I feel like is kind of our purest form of expression and not really borrowed from anybody else or any other, other genre. Interesting. So my, my dad was, uh, he was self-taught. And so I, he's always been on the other side of like, man, I wish I would have gotten into an art school just for the sake of getting the, you know, the fundamentals and the contacts. But I, I kind of agree with you guys more like you may not have developed your own style as well. If, you know, you start from here's all these frameworks, here's all these specific ways you do something. It might be harder to break out of, I don't know, but it sounds like that's could be a, you guys might yeah, agree. It's, it's easy to break out of those things when you don't know about any of them, you know, like, <laughs> right. we're completely ignorant probably on a lot of those, but it's helped our, I think it helps our art a lot. I think that's one reason we're semi successful at it because mm-hmm. our art's just original. I know that that helps sell it a lot. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah, that's it's funny. It's one of my favorite books, uh, Finite and Infinite Games. The artist uh, lays out that, you know, if you're like a finite player, if you follow the rules, you play within the boundaries. But if you're an infinite player or an artist, you play with the boundaries. You know, you move them, you change them. And right. Yeah, that's just, interesting. It opens up so much on the horizon. And, you know, you're not just looking at a square canvas. It's what is through, what is past the canvas. What's, how am I going to connect with through the canvas? Who's going to buy it? Who... Who am I going to make friends with along the way? I think that's this whole other layer of art shows that, unfortunately, right now, you know, we don't have a lot of exposure to. Um, What do you guys think about the show circuit in 2020 going forward? And how has it been in the last 10 years? Uh, Well, we started at the beginning of the recession (laughs) in about 2008, I think it was, or 2007. So we timed that perfectly. Absolutely perfect. And then it gradually got better until the past three years where it got pretty good. So I think we pretty much had like our best time up until February of this year (laughs) and our worst time (laughs) from March of this year forward. Yeah. So we were just getting to a point where it was getting comfortable to be an artist for us at least. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's really funny because now we can talk in retrospect, you know, uh, what is it? 13 whatever years later mm-hmm. um, that we always thought that it was it was hard to start during the recession mm-hmm. but then we realized later that if you started at the top you know then there's only down to go right but since we started at the bottom it was only going to get better for us <laughs> so yeah we started from the bottom now we're here that's uh, right. now, now we got back to the gotta bottom. climb back up <laughs> uh, yeah i I think that is a common um, mental trap, perhaps, that more fortunes are built in down times than in up times, because in the up times, it's competitive. Everyone has capital. Everyone's, you know, you've got, you can be lazy or sloppy and you can get, you can let it slide. You can get through. But when times are tough, like you got to be sharp on your game. You can't have any holes in your business process or or you know you just frankly you don't have a lot of room to uh handle you know events that are beyond your outside of your control so it seems like right now is like a time where most of us are starting to uh have to go through that and learn that lesson uh me is me especially you know i before uh before now you know i could have moved moved faster on projects designs you know making everything tip top shape but you know you, you just you let it drag and <laughs> And you find yourself in a, situ- a situation like we are now, and it's like, oh, should have, uh, should have done more sooner. Hmm. I mean, I, in a sense, I feel like, you know, it was, I was grateful to go through, you know, what we did at the very beginning because mm-hmm. that was a time where we really honed in our skills, mm-hmm. you know, and figured out a lot of things that you know we didn't have the luxury to waste time on, you know, back then, and then. Pretty much a year later, our daughter was born, so that really kind of kicked it up a notch. Mm. So that, that is was fun, right? That's a that's another full time job right there. Yeah. Uh, so d- when you're 
Did you modify your show schedule at all after your daughter was born, or was it sort of just on the road? Because I was one of those art show kids where, you know, I was always on the road with my dad. She's been on the road a lot. Nice. So since we started, we we do about twenty five shows a year, and we actually we haven't slowed down at all. Yeah, the whole wow, time. Cool. Yeah, so we actually did more when she was born, and that was when we decided to leave Seattle. Okay. Um, Seattle art show, you know, season is just in the summertime. Mm-hmm. And we really had to figure out how to work year round. So that was when, you know, we moved in and moved to Austin, Texas for a couple of years and just kind of bounced around until we found Fort Collins. Okay. Um, Austin, what year was that? Because Austin now is completely different than... 20, 2010? Yeah, 2010, 2010 I want to okay. say. It was right when the recession was happening. Sure. And Texas was the only spot where we could do shows still. Okay. It's still pretty good. Yeah, I've heard... Texas is such a strange market. Um, if you're not really in the art show scene, I'm always surprised at people that don't realize that Texas is like one of the best markets in the nation, if not in the world, for certain, uh, you know, certain work. Yeah, I mean, their um, disposable income there because of cost of living, everything is quite low, low. and then their houses are extremely large. Right. Um, that Texas has been really, really good to us. Um, I feel like we made a really good move making that transition from Seattle to Texas so that we can figure things out, you know, and, uh, and Texas has really been good to us. So, and it was a great experience learning about the South, Mm -hmm. you know, and living there and kind of absorbing a completely different culture. Mm -hmm. It was really fun. Yeah. I think, uh, Chris, I think on your site, I saw in the Southwest collection, um, one of your pieces that it has the the very typical like southwestern like beam roof like the mm-hmm. solid log beam roof and you just see those circ- like the circled ends of it protruding from the front of the facade mm-hmm. and that just brought it's Albuquerque it's like all of that is in Old Town and you know you nailed that look of it just felt like oh so southwest you know um, yeah we've been traveling through there for many years by now it's been like ten years so yeah I've always found that sort of architecture and the adobe you know i I love that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and do you have a background in architecture as well you'd spend a little time doing drafting and yeah um i've been drafting ever since i was really young i wanted to be an architect and so that was kind of what i really focused on even when i was in high school Mm -hmm. Um, and i i apprenticed under um an architect in seattle um, for a couple of years before i realized that architecture is not as much fun as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> it's yeah. It's more engineering than, uh, uh, than the creative aspect. Right. Well, I mean, you think art is a starving profession. Right. <laughs> Architects yeah. don't have it much easier. Right. It's, yeah. you gotta, you gotta, cho- uh, join forces with, you know, that power crew where you get, it starts sounding like a law firm, right? It's the three names and they just, you rise to the top. And if you're not one of those yeah. big games, it's, it's almost impossible. Yeah. 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 Um, well, that's cool because in your work, uh, the mid-century modern theme, you know, is definitely present in some of the pieces, which I love. Um, I, I've always loved like that Scottsdale, Arizona, like the places that were cheap that were not in California, but they were still built mid-century. Um, that's always been like a weird like desert oasis vibe. And we always did the Scottsdale Arts Festival every year. So just driving out there. I got a taste of that when I was a kid, and that's probably why I'm drawn to it now. Yeah, we love Desert Modern, that mm-hmm. look. Mm-hmm. You know, it has a beautiful, austere color palette and mm-hmm. very simple and clean lines. And basically, I think the reason why we love mid century architecture is because it goes to the heart of the structure. It's, you know, almost primitive in form in some ways. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, just very clean and concise, no fluff. Mm hmm. Yeah, the uh, architecture here in Fort Collins is all over the place, right? <laughs> it's there's the old cottages, um, the newer stuff is like that Telluride modern. That's kind of where it yeah, is. it's taken over. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's just such a weird. I have a weird time processing style and design because today is so much different than back in the '60s, '70s, '80s when all these houses were built and. Um, you know, I'm not really sure how that relates to art and creativity, but just the place that you're at really influences your frame of mind. And since you guys have had the experience of being in different cities, you know, access to different art markets, um, how's your style changed as you've kind of changed locations? Hmm. You want to answer that? 
I don't think your style's changed if at, at all. all. If at all, yeah. <laughs> you know, for me, growing up in Seattle was so important in the way that my aesthetics and kind of the look of my pieces is it, very defining. I think that where you grow up defines in a huge sense of who you are. My color palette um, just tends to lean a little bit on the dark and moody side. And I just think I grew up under a lot of clouds. <laughs> so, you know, my pieces just, you know, have that kind of sense to it. And so even though I've lived in the South and, you know, all around the country, I think I've taken that sensibility with me. Um, and also Seattle is a very kind of hip and modern city. Um, I think there's a terminology for the modern architecture that they have there. I think it's called Northwest Modern. Okay. Um, where it's a little bit woodsy, but also very clean and simple lines to their buildings. A lot of their buildings are either dark wood or painted you know, black or gray as well. And so I think no matter where we live, that kind of sensibility I take with me. Hmm. I, I, yeah, I feel like my styles pretty much stayed the same too, only that I just, I think I add new colors in different cities possibly. Mm -hmm. That's sure. the only way it might change. Like I definitely got brighter when I was in the South, a little darker when I was up in Seattle. But, but you definitely have an East Coast sensibility to yours. Yeah, that's you dark too, yeah. I think. So yeah. yeah, so that's the only way I could see it really changing you know, living in a city, we're just always trying to do new work, I think. So mm. it doesn't matter where you are, really. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, I think what's fascinating is no matter where we travel to, the people from our original region tend to find us and buy our art. So yeah. we ship a lot of pieces to the Northeast, and I ship a lot of pieces also to the Northwest. So mm. no matter, even if we're in like Arizona, the people from Washington or Oregon will find us and buy yeah, art from us. Right. And it's just really funny how that works out. That's cool. And so do you guys, uh, you have separate galleries, separate websites, or do you kind of just combine? At, you you well, do. at the moment, our websites are separate, but we've done a huge overhaul and we are set to launch our new combined website probably in the next couple of weeks. Very cool. Yeah. Um, is it going to be, is it Pergamina, Pergamena? Uh, fine yeah, Pergamina. Pergamina Fine Art. paper, parchment. Okay, sure. So is that going to be like kind of the branding of it and you can kind of. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, pretty much the paper house. Yeah. Sweet. So yeah, Pergamina is, uh, and Pergamine is Latin for paper. Okay. And so that's kind of our, um, I would say our house brand. Um, if you go and type in, you know, Navu.com, it'll still point you to Pergamina. So I'm still keeping my domain okay. name. Cool. But um, our main domain is going to be under Pergamina. Cool. I'll have all the links in the uh, description and stuff like that. That way people can, can find it. And um, that's exciting. You know, retooling the website now especially is a good, good, a good idea. And um, that's, you know, it seems like that's how a lot of the transactions are going to have to happen, at least yeah. in the short term, a couple of months. Um, yeah. we, guys, we've been planning it for a while now. Like, I remember... Basically, we set up Scottsdale, and then we broke it down like within an hour because they wow. canceled it. Yeah. Oh, so and you guys I, actually drove within, out on the way we driving home? Oh. Yeah, yeah. We they, they totally just we set everything up, of course, oh. right? And then like twenty minutes later, break wow. everything down. Everyone go home. But I just remember driving back to my parents' place, who live outside of uh, Phoenix, and we were the first thing we we're talking about is we got to get a new website. Mm -hmm. We got to get online, like. We knew, mm -hmm. I think we knew right away. It's I mean, a whole new world. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a whole different future for us now. Well, like I said, we've been so busy for over 10 years and we've been wanting to do this. That's true too. Yeah. And why not a better time than this now? This is a perfect time <laughs> right. to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now it's adapt or die. And um, it's, uh, it's actually, I keep thinking about Scottsdale. So do you guys, <laughs> did you drive out and they were still on the fence, right? Because they were, they had like, hey, this is going to, we're not sure yet, right? Oh, uh, yeah. They set up. <laughs> they let, they let not us just a up. regular booth, but a pretty large 10 by 20 booth. Oh, yeah. And I, what I it, went for it. I was <laughs> <laughs> I We had an island. I mean, we had art on all It was all beautiful. Sides. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any pictures of it? We'll have to put that I in there. I know. We'll I take it. No, I think oh, I was too goodness. mad at that point. Or, oh, you know, I was just exhausted. It was... It wasn't that hot for Scottsdale, but it was pretty hot. And well, we had we to... We were setting up for a couple of hours. You know how it is. So, yeah. And this was the one time we couldn't pull up to our booth, so we had to dolly about a block away yeah, to get that. all this stuff just, back and far. Easy. I've done that with the furniture before. It was my dad. And, that's fine, huh? You know, oh, that's yeah. fine. Did they, what do they do with the booth fee? They returned it. 
They gave it. Right? They okay. gave us back yeah. our booth fee for that particular show. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't had any trouble with any shows yet that I know of, right? No, not yet. Yeah, hmm. with the booth fee thing. And then obviously all the rest of the shows after that that you had planned were just yeah they were all gone. Canceled. Well, we were at La Quinta. Fortunately, we yeah, were already we were in Palm Springs in already. The south oh, okay, it wasn't West. a big deal. Some of our friends are driven down, you know, from Florida, yeah. from Milwaukee, like sixteen yeah. hours just to like get <sighs> there and then set up and then have to break wow. down and drive home. That's just so brutal. It was devastating. I mean, not only for us, sad. but was... just to be there and just to have the rug pulled out from under you. Yeah. I mean, that, that feeling that we had when we found out yeah, was I think we both, like I said, we both felt like this. there was no more shows the rest of the year. I really felt it. like that. Yeah. I don't know how, but I just knew yeah. it just wasn't going to happen. It was pretty devastating. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's like a zero. It's like, hey, um, here's a zero show for you. And, oh, yeah, we're not, you know. Like that's such a hard mental uh, something to process when you're there. Oh, I you know a zero show on any normal weekends tough to deal with, but a zero without even getting the chance at selling something yeah. after all the work of setting up and I driving. I mean, they really try <clears throat> the the organizers, um, Whitney, you know, mm -hmm. um, at Scottsdale. They really really tried hard to make the show happen. Yeah, I don't blame them at all or anything. Else. But the moment that spring training canceled, which yeah. was yeah. literally an hour into setup. Wow. Um, so I was getting our last load and I was right next to the museum and they came out and they looked at us and I just knew, I just knew because it was all of them, the entire crew came out and, you know, just started talking and then I had to run over to where Chris was and a bunch of other artists were there and I just told them, you guys just stop because it's over. That's it. Wow. Yeah. What a, what a, a year this has been. I know. <laughs> um, yeah. I, like you said, we can't really blame the show because just the whole year, it feels like it's really been dominoes, except you don't know what's behind the domino that you're staring at where, you know, the domino over here just fell, but yeah. these are still up and then some are, it's, it's impossible to navigate right now. Um, it's an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> I'd have to yeah. say, you know, some days, you know, we, we make a big sale and we sell a large painting and we feel like, we're feeling like it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of weeks later, you know, and the news is getting bad and the, the cases are going up. We're like, Oh my gosh, you know, mm -hmm. when is this going to end? I mean, there is no sense. Yeah, like of you were talking about zero. We were like, I was just thinking like we had two shows that are actually pretty good. Our Palm Springs, we do pretty well down cool. there with my mid century mod stuff. And then you know, I was thinking it's 23 zeros like after that, right. you know, and right. you're, you're like, okay, <laughs> Yes, this is just We had an incredible lineup of shows this year, too. Yeah, you know, we do 25 shows. So we got yeah. into the top 25 shows wow. this year. I mean. So it was going to be a stellar year, and now it's. <laughs> we were hoping, yeah. <laughs> That's like the nature of the business, I think. Is. Oh, man. I, <clears throat> yeah, I can't fathom having that all planned out and just. And not having a backup plan, that's the thing. I think you guys are pretty smart about, you had some other irons on fire. You have, you know, you have the gallery, you have the website. It's sort of, uh, you were one of the more flexible, you know, duos out there. I think there's some people scrambling. And what I've heard so far is that, you know, your list is now worth its weight in gold. Um, yeah. How, how has your list been and how long have you had it? Because I know some artists change or they, they collect here and there or, some names they get from only from sales and then you that ends up being like your 10 year 20 year customer right she's been really good about it so I'll let you answer that but she's been collecting names for over a decade so i don't even yeah. know what our list is by now and um, but it's good it's cool. Lee, and luckily she's been very aggressive about doing that yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah very yeah. good i mean definitely i mean i would say your list is your gold and also taking notes about each purchase and then entering them into mm -hmm. your list so that <clears throat> when they email you, you're like, oh, hey, you know, how is that piece that you previously purchased in 2015? You mm -hmm. know, um, I think when I grew up in the restaurant business, it really helps me learn to remember things about people. So just making it personal, like, oh, how are your kids doing? Or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, how is how is Texas? You know, that I feel like if I ever got that kind of personal attention, it just makes it easier to to support somebody or buy from somebody or keep that person in mind. So I would have to say we've been very fortunate that um, the past four months, 
a lot of our purchases have been from customers that we've known for. I mean, you name it, it goes back 10 years, you know, or plus. But uh, I mean, it's it's been amazing that people buy multiple pieces from us. Mm -hmm. And that was one reason why we um, combined our websites is because our customers, if they buy from Chris, they will eventually buy from me and vice versa. So we do mm -hmm. play off our lists um, from each other very well. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's so, I'm so glad that you guys have that because it seems like that's the lifeblood here going out uh, from here going forward. It's, uh, that's really what people are going to try and cultivate. And, you know, my dad was a, is a genius at remembering people, their face at the show, what they talked about, what they ordered. You know, he did a lot of the deliveries because it's furniture. So he would, you know, go to their house, deliver, set it up, chat, sometimes have dinner. And that, it seems like that connection is just, that's what you get at, an art show that's as a patron that's why you would go to an art show it's you know you might need a you might need something here or there for your for your home your you know spot it's like oh i just need to pick something up but what you get is no nope, i'm getting to know this person i get their story i get to hang out with them you know you can you can shoot the shit with an artist and burn up all their time during the day i mean if you want as a as a customer but uh that's not available for the foreseeable future. Um, I'm curious how, and it's really hard to convey that over the internet. Um, we were talking earlier about the uh, online auctions that some of the shows are deciding to put up an auction instead of the show. And, you know, I think that's definitely, um, it's a, it's a benefit for the artists because at least it's something right. But it's hard to do because we all know that all the sales, all the, uh, interactions, the connections, that's face to face. That's, that's a handshake. That's, uh, getting to know somebody, right? Yeah. I just feel like that interaction that we're used to having at art shows, we just cannot count on at least for the foreseeable future. And so we just have to get used to the fact that we have to figure out other avenues of selling, like you said, on those online actions or virtual shows, just figuring out a way to cultivate new followers um, for us has been really, really challenging, but I think it's doable. There's a lot of people that do do it. You just have to put in the time and the legwork to figure it out. And that's kind of where we're at in that process. And I know we can do it. it like I said, it just takes an immense amount of effort. Um, and you just don't know what kind of payoff or outcome you know, it's going to have, but you just have to have faith that it's going to work because at this point there are no other options. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. How's that, uh, how's that affecting your work? Cause if you're lucky enough where you're selling some work, you have to keep making it right. Mm -hmm. But trying to make, make to do your creative work in such a, a crazy environment, a it's either a nice respite and you can really dive into it more and it's a nice way to compartmentalize or B you just, you know, it's just not happening. The, you know, the muses aren't there today because of all the stuff that's happening out outside. Um, have you guys been able to keep getting in the flow of things and keep producing? You want to answer that uh, first? I haven't, no, not really. <laughs> I've been, um, I do a little bit here and there, but not, I, I used to wake up at 5.30 and work until 6 every day in the studio. That mm -hmm. was seven days a week always. Like, And now I'm doing a couple hours a day, you know, maybe in the morning. And then we have our daughter at home, and we're just trying to figure out how to do, like I said, the online business and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. we're, we're working on our property and our studio and trying to fix that up a little bit when we can. <clears throat> so not as much. I mean, I don't think you've been working as much either, right? Like, no, I mean, the work that we have been doing, fortunately, recently has been all commission work. Yeah, it's very specific commission very stuff. Very cool. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> our usual old clients come back and they want a different piece. And so Chris and I have done quite a bit of commission work in the past couple of months. And that is nice because it gets us, it kind of forces you to get back into the studio. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we're both working on a couple of commissions right now, but you know, it's definitely very distracting though. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I mean, our daughter has not been to school since February. Right. Um, and so just making sure that she's happy has been a priority for us. And also this has been a great time for us to finish 
you know, getting our studio together. This is time that we've never had before. Mm. And so we are it's really, true. it's not like we've slowed down in any way. It's just we've kind of shifted our attention to other things that we know we won't be able to get to if the show season starts back up. Mm-hmm. But we're still, we're still working. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, different than we used to. Instead of scrambling and getting all of our artwork done, you know, before a show mm-hmm. and spending a whole day packing, mm-hmm. right now we're just kind of, focusing on other things right now and still working when we when we can yeah the uh family balance has always been hard for artists um for the very very few that had kids i think very that's, few that's, yeah that's something i've noticed I, like i i started going to shows when i was a baby like it was my dad literally and my mom you know she was helping out and they would set up a crib in the back of yes. the booth yes and i'd be back there and so I don't really remember all the the younger years, but when I was a you know a young kid, a teenager, a young adult, I mean I've kind of gone through the whole thing, taking that lifestyle for granted, um, and I never really thought about hey this is this is like really hard for my parents because you know a they have to try and make a living on the road, and so what do you what's your experience been with uh, family life in the art <clears throat> scene? Well, I want to say, honestly, it hasn't been as bad as you might think. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Because traveling with a child under six is pretty easy, actually, because you just go into cities all the time and take them yeah. to parks and Disney <laughs> World. And I mean, they're having the time of their lives. Yeah. It only gets complicated when they get into school. I think that's when mm. it gets hard for us because now we're flying back and forth. We can't stay as long as we used to. To Seattle and to uh, or, like the shows. Oh, like, to the shows. Yeah, so we'll fly to Texas and maybe we'll okay. leave our van there, mm. like do a show, fly back, you know, get our daughter in school, gotcha. make sure she's looking, fly back and forth. Back. The logistics so It's gotten more complicated as she yeah. gets older. And I'm assuming that's just going to get harder as well. Yeah, so typically Chris will take off a couple of days before the show with the van. Yeah, I'm the truck driver. He's <laughs> nice. the driver. He's good at that. Yep. <laughs> and then I will fly in with our daughter pretty much either the morning of the show or the night before. And then um, either sometimes we drive home together or we'll leave the van down there and we'll fly home together um, on Monday morning. Cool. And so it's we've racked up a lot of uh, airline miles in the past couple of years. Just for school, just to get her back just and forth. Just to get her back to school. And are you, are you eager to redeem those now? <laughs> or are you going to wait a couple yeah. of years? We're going to wait now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what we're going to do with those now. Yeah, yeah I'll, that's, that's one industry that... Uh, it's like, hey, I had kind of configured um, part of my lifestyle around flying from Fort Collins or Denver to Albuquerque mm. when I'm not kind of working full time in the shop. And now it's like, well, now it's back to the eight hour drive. Yeah. If you know. Um, so, yeah, I can imagine trying. You can't plan. This is the point in time where long-term planning is now like that's an ancient practice because <laughs> yeah. you just, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but I, you mentioned one thing, you know, having fun as a kid going out and visiting cities. I think to the extent that I'm a good human being, I think it's because I was exposed to so many different people, different things mm-hmm. really early on. And that's one thing that I would never trade for the world. And I realized like it's such a valuable trait, um, Mm-hmm. especially for a young person, even to travel in your own country um, and Definitely. just meet people. That's, that's huge. We've really seen that in our daughter too. She's very open-minded. Mm-hmm. She's, it's very easy for her to make friends because mm-hmm. she's used to just showing up at an art show and seeing some kids over there she's never met before and having to go say hi. And mm-hmm. So yeah, she's definitely... She's very grounded. Yeah, very she grounded. She has a good head on her shoulders, just like you. I think you. that's all from traveling. She's <laughs> yes. just seen a lot. Right. Um, it was funny because when she was born and we had to start taking her on the road, we thought we were being bad parents <laughs> taking her out of the house all the time. Right. But, you know, as the years went along and seeing her at every single zoo out there and parks and, you know, she, I, I can't tell you how many times she's been to Disney World. <laughs> right. She grew up, you know, just having a great childhood and we were with her all the time. And mm-hmm. like Chris said, she just saw so much, you know, as a child. And when she started school, you know, in kindergarten, we noticed that there was a difference in her, just the way that she composed herself and Mm. the way that she handled herself. Um, She was a different kid. And we can definitely say that that's attributed to, you know, the art show life. It's, it's, 
it's you think it's hard, but when you actually go through it and see how it benefits your child, you're glad that it's happened. We would never change that. Yeah, I, yeah, Chris. No, I'm sorry, good. No, um, I, I was. I think my on the, on the occasions that I traveled with my dad, um, and my mom had to stay because at a certain point, my mom kind of split off from the art uh, business. And just working like with my dad, she had to, she got a full time job, and it was a way after 08, especially, it was a way to just stabilize things so that he could keep making furniture, and she was way more stable. And so she wasn't able to do as many shows with us. Um, but that was right when I was kind of a teenager. I was getting into those teen years, 13, 15. So I'm sure she was worried, like, you know, where's your dad taking you? And, <laughs> yeah, totally. you know, what are you guys doing? And I, I have this memory from uh, Milwaukee when we had some good friends there. and. I was like 13 and it was after, after setup, we were just going out and, you know, partying really. Cause it was my dad and all the art show friends, but I was 13. So I was like tagging along, but I was not aware of Wisconsin's liquor laws where if you're with an, a legal guardian, you can go into a bar and drink at like, I don't know if there's an age, there's any age. It's like, if the guardian is there, you can drink. So I was 13 and we wow. go to a bar and the bartender's like, Hey kid, what do you want? I'm like soda. <laughs> and he's like, sure. You don't want a beer or something. I'm like, what? no, <laughs> he's like, you know, that's the law here. Like, is that, that's your dad. It's, you know, it's fine. And as a kid, I was like, wow, that's so weird. Like, uh, and I don't know if that's still the case, but, uh, and there's some great bars in Milwaukee. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> we love I Milwaukee. Can't, I can't imagine. Yeah. The kids, we actually, our daughter has been to like a lot of the, the bar. <laughs> Uh, we've we've taken her to like a couple of the same thing where and, all the artists right. will go out and of course we'll have our ten year old daughter with us and you guys been to uh, Balzac? Have you been to that place? That sounds really familiar. I think we did go. It's in Milwaukee. It was one there. of those like I have some memories from that place too. And isn't that the place that we went? I to think last? the last one. Yeah, yeah I think we actually did go that okay. one. Yeah. It was yeah. amazing. It's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. And then there's that uh, where do they do the fish fry? That giant like fish fry it was like a Friday thing. There's some uh, huge. Are you talking about the public market? It was an indoor place. Yeah. yeah it might have been a was it market. that? Yeah. yeah. That's one of our favorite places. We usually stay in the hotel across the street. Okay, so thanks. we can get lots of seafood. Yeah. Yeah. That place was rowdy. I've only been there once, but it was rowdy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's one of those places where we were with some friends, uh, Mark Winter and Beth and my dad and a few other artists just from the show. But I just remember like, like everybody knew everybody in that place and it just was chaos. Uh, <laughs> but that's... That was the stuff that was opened my eyes to like, this is how people have fun, you know, doing ma like making a living, doing something, but also having a, a shitload of fun after and during the shows. Even mm -hmm. it's such a unique. Yeah, it's definitely possible. Yeah, if uh, it's possible, but it's like almost guaranteed, I would think. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> if yeah. you're in it for a few years, like you just you find your groove, you find your peeps. You know? I think so for sure. Yeah. I think that's definitely the allure of artist life mm -hmm. that once you kind of get a taste of that and like you said, you find your friends and where to go, um, it's, it can be a lot of fun. And I think that's why a lot of artists who are not doing shows right now are struggling with all this because their community has been taken away, mm -hmm. their access to, you know, friends and their release is also gone because most of us that become artists we're kind of gypsies at heart in yeah. a way. And also we're very free spirited. So being able to travel and, you know, see your friends and just experience something different every weekend is, uh, is definitely something you can get addicted to. Yeah. The, what's the saying? There's no, the two most addictive substances on earth are like heroin and a steady paycheck. <laughs> and you know, the artist lifestyle <laughs> does not have a steady paycheck, <laughs> but re what replaces it is, the community, the sort of carny, like, you know, roving band. It's like a, a distributed family, right? There's, there's just so many friends all across the country, but because you see them in the same context every weekend, every other weekend, it, it's such a surreal, you know, mm -hmm. it feels like your home is now spread out across the whole landscape. Yeah, I, I feel more at home on the road sometimes yeah. than I do at home. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I spent way more time on the road. I've yeah, I've definitely heard that from other artists, and that's interesting. That's that's strange when yeah. you're driving across Kansas right. for the umpteenth time, and you think, <laughs> "Oh my god, I actually feel more comfortable here than at my house." At that point, sometimes it's yeah, your van kind of becomes your sanctuary. Huh? Yeah, 
You learn how to pack it. You learn where all the, you know, where the anchor points are, where you (laughs) fit things, where, you know, this thing always rattles off and I have to keep fixing that every time we do a trip. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. It's all these little quirks, right? It's the, the idiosyncrasies of being on the road. I Um, think um, art show artists are also a very unique breed as well. Um, When you talk to other people, um, that are just regular everyday people that, you know, like your neighbors, you know, or, you know, other parents are art, art show artists are really different from them. Yeah. They're, they're a quirky bunch and, and I love them for it. You know, I just, I just can't find any other replacement to my art show friends in our current community. It is not the same kind of people and you have to love them for their spirit, you know, and, their excitement for art and life. That's, that's kind of what I miss. Yeah. That's uh, you kind of know an artist when you see one, right? For sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> From a mile away. From a mile away. Um, and so what, what about the work? Cause this is a question that I have for you guys. I, and I've only started thinking about this since I've started the podcast and being off the show circuit. I'm used to what, I can build and make and I'm used to what my dad does. So I kind of have like an internal assessment of quality in work, but I'm because I took the artists um, or the art show lifestyle for granted for so many years, I don't really have a good gauge of like, if I go see someone's studio or see their work, like I have no reference. Um, But there's obviously a bare minimum like has to be quality. And I know that you guys, because you specialize so heavily early on in your careers and you have talents that are actually so rare that automatically like that sort of puts your, your work in a certain category, right? Where the, the, it's almost like there's a fundamentals to producing art and then the more subjective creative aspect of it. And so I have, I guess my question is how do you guys value your own work compared to what you see on the circuit? And how do you know when someone's, you know, it's like, Hey, they're new, but they're really talented or they've been at it for a long time and they just do the same thing over again. They don't really try new things. Where's your value at artwork? Cause that's something I've been struggling with. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I guess I would say, what would you say now? I've learned from going to museums and lots of art shows and just being around art for over a decade. Well, we, we definitely know what quality work looks like. That's for sure. I feel like quality of artwork uh, and what you like is very subjective. It, it's well, quality is one thing. And then like your eye, what you like, that's what he's saying. Yes. So, and I think, I think there is no standard. I think that yeah. you like what you like um, and you have to be okay with that. Everybody sees value in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know what you like, but there's so many other people who have different tastes and might not agree with you. And so I just feel like, you know, you just go with your instinct and do the best that you can and your eye will not trick you. Yeah. I would hmm. say experience, I guess would be the word. And we do have yeah. a lot of experience. You just have to see yes. a lot of art, probably like hmm. you have your whole life to know what good and bad is. I think. Yeah. And yeah. okay. So that's interesting. Um, how would you recommend getting exposure to art because now that museums are probably closed for a while, um, it's hard, right? You have to know people that are collectors or you have to, you know, have somewhere in person to see it. Cause it's such a different experience in person versus online. Right. I'm afraid you have to be in the business <clears throat> or grow up in the business like you did to mm-hmm. really get that kind of experience that mm-hmm. I'm talking about. You know, I'm thinking like 10, 15 years of sure. really looking at sculptures for say, or, or, or works on paper. Mm-hmm. And then you can just almost look at them right away and just tell instantaneously mm-hmm. they have value. You know, yeah. I think that's the sad thing about losing art shows is that it was such a great institution in a sense of, allowing people who didn't know what they were looking at or kind of an intro to art is go to an art show and see two, 300 different kinds of art. I think that was a great way for young kids to learn and look about and look at art. Now that it's kind of no longer exists, you know, the best that they can do is just, I don't know, read books, 
Yeah, and so you're going to have to just look online, and that's yeah. going to be hard. For someone just starting out, I yeah. think that'd be really hard. It's hard. So uh, the piece, so I guess I'll you know, publicly announce, like the piece that I won in the Cherry Creek Arts Auction um, is one of yours now. And Yay. it was, when I, I knew when I saw it that I, it was already, it was like the decision in my mind, as soon as I saw it, it was like done almost. Because I met you guys at the Lakefront Arts Festival last summer. Yes. And, you know, I was just walking down the, the booths and I was like, hey, Fort Collins, you know. Wow. So it's small world. Introduced myself. You know, we kind of met up and, and and I really liked you guys' work. And now, actually, you were on the, you were the poster, right? You had yeah, the poster the for the. feature artist. Right. Feature artist for that year. And um, so it just, my brain's like, oh, you know, connected the dots. Here we are. Um, and. And your mom has one of Chris's yes. pieces so as well. So <laughs> my mom started working from home Thanks, last mom. summer. Yeah. <laughs> and she, you know, redid her office and it was totally, you know, serendipitous, I guess, because she set it all up and she's like, all right, I need some artwork. And I remember um, mentioning you guys to my parents and I was like, hey, they're in Fort Collins. I'm going to try and, you know, meet up with them at some point. And so then I think my mom kind of you know, I sent her, sent her your websites and she checked it out. And I've met your mom though. Did she, was she in Milwaukee? She was in Cherry Creek. Okay. That's yeah. when she came up to right, us. Right. Right. Yes. And so I think that's the connection of, I've seen your work in person. It might've been a year ago. It might've been eight months ago, but I saw it. And then when I saw it on the auction, it's almost like that's, that's what made the, you know, aside from like the personal connection, it was just seeing it in person and then getting the story of like how intensive your guys' work is. Cause you make the paper, you cut it. I mean, and you can probably talk about the whole process if you want, or at least give, give the overview just so that people know. Right. <laughs> so, um, back in the day, um, you know, our, we, we made the paper out of like Mulberry Pope. And then uh, once our daughter was born, and then we had to have a, a family owned paper store that we used to live around the corner from do it for us in Taiwan. And so this whole process of ordering the paper and to when it arrives actually takes about six months. And wow. when it does arrive, um, what was a rectangular box is now like this mashed up box because it's made such a long journey. But uh, our paper is actually uh, traditionally made from mulberry cotton fibers that were kind of uh, processed down or blended down. And then um, if you look at the paper in person close up, there's also uh, wood chips and straw also pressed into it to give it almost like a, uh, a cloud-like or woodsy feel. And the direct translation from Mandarin is cloudy dragon paper. That's actually the name of the paper. And it gives kind of the negative space, a lot of um, texture and a tactile quality to it. Yeah. I, I like that, um, the depth to it. And I think in one of the descriptions on, on your site, I found reaching across the void. I thought that was such a good way to describe the feeling. It's like when you, and this probably goes back to like Chris when you're saying when you see something you kind of know right. Mm -hmm. It's like your eye you it's can so you can personal. trust your eye mm -hmm. and it's it is it's like you guys' work has so much depth to it that you just you get that impression of like I'm looking at something but I know there's something past it and that's like I love that just there's a void and if you can bridge that with your first your eye then your imagination you really it's like oh yeah this is it's an emotional thing you know it's not just a transaction i think that's what's hard to communicate to people that don't collect or don't buy work yeah and i think that that's something that is found in both of our work is kind of the emphasis on negative space and allowing the viewer to interpret the negative space on their own um mm -hmm. that gives the piece you know more meaning and more interpretation because you're not spooning spoon feeding the audience all the details right you're not kind of minimizing their intelligence in a way. Um, so I think that, you know, emphasizing kind of the negative space and the void has always been an important component in both of our work, allowing the piece to breathe in a sense. Mm. Like that. And then you were talking about, you know, as a collector, I think that what is really unique about um, art and 
the audience that it attracts is that in a way the artwork is kind of a window to the artist's soul um, and the people that are attracted to it in a sense you have some sort of commonality in how you live lo- live your life or how you see your life and so usually we find that um, we have a lot in common with our collectors because the artwork says so much about the person who's making it as well as the person who's acquiring it or whoever or the person who likes it mm-hmm. um, and so I think that that is very unique to art alone is that is that feeling yeah it's truly uh you can describe it as much as you want, but until you experience it, right? It's one of those things you just, uh, I don't know. It, you either have it or you don't in, in some ways. Or you uh, either like it or you don't, You like right? it or you don't, right? Yeah. Move yeah. on, you know, keep walking to the next booth. Mm-hmm. Um, there was, what was I going to say? I had some, something reminded me of uh, like creativity. And sometimes I think I've heard artists say like, my work is not a choice. Like I have to do this. Otherwise I go crazy. Right. It's almost like, uh, an outlet. The energy has to go somewhere, right? You're either going to bottle it up, burn it off somewhere unproductively, or, you know, if you're lucky, find a channel. And, uh, so that's the, I think that's the part about connecting with people is like, they can see that in your work. It's like, and like you said, this little piece of their soul is like, it just definitely there. It's there's something about it, right? And you know, you know it when you see it. Mm-hmm. I it's, think I think it's their passion. Like yeah. you can see that because I think they could spend their time being a stockbroker or a doctor or anything. Like I just think they would focus twelve hours a day on it because they're just those kind of people, those mm-hmm. artists. So I just think it's like this. I don't know. It's hard to explain, but you just really want to be in your studio working. I don't know. Maybe you feel like you're doing something good. I don't know. I think. I think we've always probably wanted to be artists, but just didn't know how to get there. And once we started doing it, we felt like we found something. Mm. Um, And that's why we can work, you know, 20 hours a day and not feel like we were working. We just enjoy doing it so much. So, you know, we probably always wanted to be artists and just didn't know it. Right. And do you guys work together at the same time? Or do you kind of, if one person's in the studio, do you kind of... Switch we'll off. work at the same time. We're on separate sides of the studio. Okay. So and you kind of peek over and be like, oh, they're, you know, Chris <laughs> beat me. He's got to catch up or not anymore. You know. I don't <laughs> think so. Like we've been doing it for so long now. We just, we, we don't get into our zone. Just, yeah. Our studio for all of you listening viewers <laughs> is about like 25 feet wide and 50 feet long. Would you say it's about 50 feet? I guess so. So yeah. there's enough space in between us. Yes. Yeah. There's plenty of room. Hey, that's, that sounds like the perfect setup. I think, uh, you know, when you're working with um, a spouse or a significant other and you've got the space and you've got, you know, just it's like, ah, you can just kind of settle in. And that's that's really when you start probably doing your best work. I think the early years for artists is are the hardest when you're, like you oh, said, yeah. just trying to figure out how the heck do I do this? How the heck do I make this happen? And um, it's almost like that's the, you know, that's what filters out the people that, don't make it for one reason or another, but, uh, it's, it's wonderful to see that you guys have made it through all of the challenges in a normal world. And then now adapting to this new frontier, you know, the unknown, <laughs> the unknown. Um, well, and that's supposedly artists are the ones that confront the unknown and they wrestle with it and they, you know, channel it and they make work out of it. And so who knows, maybe this is going to be, one of the best times for, for artists because they're forced to, you know, think differently. Yeah. I told you when this first started too, the pandemic, I think I told you, I remember you, maybe you remember this, but I said that, um, we've been training for this like our whole lives, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's just one more time that we have to worry. Yeah. I think as artists, so innately, you're always challenging yourself. And so, yes, we're in a pandemic and yes, there's no more art shows, <laughs> but this is kind of what we do on a daily basis is constantly trying to find new ideas, trying to, we always have to change. Even when the art shows are good, you have to figure out how to make it work. Mm -hmm. So you can't be complacent almost never. And so. Yeah. You can be at a great show and still zero. Yes. I've done that. Totally. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We've, we've been there. So you, you, you know, challenging yourself 
and always trying to think of different ways of doing things is kind of what we're bred for. And so I, I think the art industry will make it. It might look different, you know, when we come out of it. But, but I expect to see a lot of the same artists from before who've yeah. been doing it for a while. Some of the veterans, again, yes, they will be Who've weathered storm after storm for decades. They'll be fine, I'm like sure. Like your dad. Your dad's going to be dad back. Your dad will be fine, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm actually missing the art shows myself. And, you know, he was, he was kind of semi-retired. But I, I, if we ever see another show um, and we ever end up at another show, I, man, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> for sure, we it are too. Nice. Yeah, we are too. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I think that's a good place to end. Um, tell people how they can find you guys online, social, all that stuff. Okay. So uh, Chris's website is www.pergaminafineart.com and that's spelled P-E-R-G-A-M-E-N-A-F-I-N-E-A-R-T.com. <laughs> mine is a little bit shorter. Uh, mine is www.navu.com, N-H-A-V-U-U. Dot com and we also have a Facebook page that we share. Just type in Facebook Chris Wheeler or Navu. Um, we both have Instagram pages. So if you go on our Facebook page, you can click on the links to get to our Instagram page. It's also on our website as well. Uh, we're active on Pinterest, LinkedIn. Uh, we both have online galleries via Sachi. And that's S A A T C H I. And Chris is also on Artful Home. Now, if you can't find us through those other avenues, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yep, that's it right there. Um, all that will be in the description. And uh, you'll see some activity from me on Instagram. I'll post uh, a photo of the, some of the pieces in the work and some of the studio shots. I think uh, we've got some good, uh, some nice lighting today in Fort Collins. It's overcast and, you know, it's like a, it's a dream for photographers. So hopefully everything comes out good. And, um, Hey, we'll have to do this again for sure. That was fun. Thank we'll you have for to add us. in. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank yeah, you guys thank for, you. for doing it and, uh, you know, being very hospitable in these uncertain times. Glad. Thank Great. you for having yeah. us. Thanks for having us. All right. Peace out. All right. Oh.